Carolyn. Why, well, Mary Ginn and Wine, it's good to see you back in your place. Good to see you here. I find that when I preach, uh, people remember the children's sermons better than they do the sermon. So I'm going to start today with a children's sermon. How about that? I want to tell you a story about way back in the days when Saul was king of Israel. And they were at battle, they were at war with a group of people called the Philistines. And at one time they amassed the armies to, to have a, a, a big battle and they were actually on opposite hillsides with a big valley between them. And as they prepared for war, the Philistines sent out one of their warriors. And he was an impressive specimen. His name, he was from Gath and his name was Goliath. And he strode out there and challenged any champion from Israel to come out and fight him one-on-one -on -one with a very interesting proposition that, that if he lost, the Philistines would serve the Israelites as slaves and vice versa. And he stood out and, and as, as he made the call, you would have thought that someone, the best fighter, even Saul himself, who Scripture tells us was a full head taller than anyone else in the country, uh, would have stepped up there to fight him. But this champion was over nine feet tall. A monstrous man, and as a matter of fact, even his armor, just the armor, his chain mail weighed 125 pounds. The head of his spear weighed 15 pounds. He had a shield bearer that went in front of him just to carry his shield for him. So it must have been a pretty scary proposition because Saul didn't want any part of it. And he and his advisors got together and says, have we got anybody who can come out and fight this man? And they offered him a fortune if he would do it, even the hand of his own daughter in marriage. No takers. Well, morning after morning, this Goliath would step out to the front lines. So you can just see him standing like this and, and taunting the, the battle lines of the Israelites and saying something like this. Bark, 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 bark. <laughs> so, come on, you chickens, come out. And come. Will not anybody come out and fight? And he did this for over a month. Well, finally, uh, there were three soldiers in, the, in Saul's army who had a little brother who came to check on them. And when little brother got there, he just happened to be there one day when, when Goliath came out and, and taunted the armies. And he said, who's this dude? Who does he think he is taunting the armies of the living God? Now, you got to think how that must have gone, gone over with the soldiers because here's this shrimp of a kid, must have been 12, 13 years old. And he wants to know, was, why are y'all all afraid of him? And he's looking at all the soldiers of the, of the Israelite army because no one would go out and fight. And so he said, well, if nobody else will do it, I'll do it. Stop and think how ridiculous that was. He didn't weigh as much as Goliath's armor. And yet he wanted to fight him. So he went to Saul and he says, hey, you got any takers on this deal? And Saul says, no, nobody will do it. Here I am. Saul must have chuckled a little bit and said, this is kind of embarrassing because of all my soldiers. You know, you're the one. You're not even a soldier. You're a shepherd boy. And so he said, no, no big deal. I have killed lions and I'll kill bears trying to get to the, to the sheep. And so this doesn't look like any big thing to me because I'm in God's army. Saul says, okay, you're the only taker I've got. Let's put some armor on you. So he tried putting his own armor on the boy, who, by the way, was only 12 or 13. Saul was the tallest man in the kingdom. How do you think that went? So I'm sure the boy was just completely weighted down, and he said, uh, King, this is not going to do it. Uh, the only way I fought before is just with this here sling. Let me get five rocks out of the river, and I'll go see what we can do about it. So he went out and approached Goliath. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. What must Goliath have thought? He's calling for a challenger. He fully expects that they're going to send out Arnold Schwarzenegger, and instead, here comes Justin Bieber. <laughs> they're sending a punk, a shrimp of a kid, out to fight him. Well, rather than just, uh, just kind of giving you my version, I want you to, to hear what the Bible has to say about this encounter because I love it. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. At that, David turned around and ran, right? 
you got to think this boy's got no sense at all because he's standing out there where no man in the army would go and the, and the giant threatens him. You can just see him hovering over him to emphasize his height. But David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Psalms 21 and 22. This was an odd month as I studied these because Psalm 22 is one of the richest of all the Psalms. It is the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. Uh, you will recognize it immediately. Uh, I read through it at first and, and was preparing my lesson wrapped around Psalm 22. And as Dan explained to you in the first service, if you were here, sometimes funny things happen on the way to a lesson. And God says, I got a point for you in Psalm 21. I said, well, thank you very much, sir. I'm not interested. I'm studying <laughs> Psalm 22. <laughs> and, and he said, hello. I think we're going to talk about Psalm 21. But so I'll tell you what I want to do with Psalm 22. It is rich. I'm going to read through it without a lot of interruption because I think that's the best way to do Psalm 22. And I want to give you an introduction to it. But we're going to do Psalm 22 first, if you don't mind. So turn, if you will, and, and join me there. Now, Psalm 22, as I said, was the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. And it's got a, a little unofficial title that I've always really loved. It's called The Gospel According to David. Heard about the gospel according to Matthew, Mark. Luke, John, but throughout history, this has been known as the gospel according to David, and here's what I want you to do, if you will. Uh, as we read it, as I said, I'm going to try to do it without much commercial interruption here, but as we read it, I want you to visualize this, that David is at the foot of the cross. Now, I know that requires a, sus a willing suspension of disbelief, but I want you to think of David as being at the foot of the cross when he penned this under the inspiration of the Spirit. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Where have you heard those words before? Yeah. Yeah. To me, one of the greatest proofs for the authority and the veracity of Scripture is the fulfillment of prophecy. That words that were penned so many centuries before would come to pass at later times just as God said they would. Uh, it wasn't by accident that Jesus said these words on the cross. Um, there was an awful thing that happened to Jesus on the cross, God abandoned him. I, I don't know of another way to say it or another way to put it, but, but this is the way that God allowed Jesus to become sin, is that he had to turn his back on him for a while. And so Jesus, in, in his agony, is sensing that separation. And as he says, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? I think of David at a time, at a, a, an obviously low time, uh, this is one of those instances that I mentioned to you last week that I believe that that's one reason why Scripture is so rich, that there is a very literal reading of this, and that is David, at a low time in his life, is calling out to God and saying, where are you? Anybody here ever done that? I think that's part of the human condition when we're at our lowest is to wonder where God is in all of it, and David is indeed doing this. But when, when the Holy Spirit inspired David to pen that, although David may not have known it at the time, the Holy Spirit understood that there was an application coming in the future, 
and that there was an application for each and every one of us today. So that's what I love about the scriptures. Not only is there a single application, in this case not a, a double application, but there's a broad, a broad spread application for us today. David felt it. Christ felt it on the cross. And there are times when we feel it too. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night and you're silent. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever had your prayers just come right back to you and you think, I don't know if, have you heard the, the phrase that they're not getting past the ceiling? Sometimes you wonder if God hears you. And yet in the midst of it, David stopped and said, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were saved. And you they trusted and were not disappointed. So he says, I know that you have been faithful. There's no reason to think that you're not being faithful again. But right now, I'm just in a pickle. God, please answer me. I want you to remember who's saying this now. This is David. Who is he? A, he's the king. B, he's a man after God's own heart. Arguably one of the greatest kings in, in Israel's history. And look how he describes himself. But I am a worm and not a man. The worm's not a very good translation, but it's kind of a low insect. Uh, he said, I'm an insect. What does that tell you? That on the hierarchy of creation, you know, man has dominion over the animals, and a, and a lowly insect is probably the lowest of the low. That's, that's how he's comparing himself. It, it's kind of a, uh, akin to Paul saying, I'm chief of sinners. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. What do you think Jesus felt on the cross? Were they mocking him there? Were they hurling insults there? Absolutely. He, and they're shaking their heads saying, He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And you can see uh, the little plaque above Jesus. And, and them taunting him, saying, call on your God to come save you. David saying the same thing hundreds of years before. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for the trouble is near and there is no one to help. Is that true for David? And is that true for Jesus? Have you been with him since the womb? Of course. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. I thought that was kind of interesting. I did some, uh, some investigation about Bashan. Uh, that was a part of the land that was known for lush pastures. It's kind of interesting having livestock myself. I could do with a lush pasture right now, believe me. But the implication there is that the bulls from that part of the country are well-fed, larger and fiercer than anywhere else in the country. So he's talking about his enemies surrounding him, and they are the largest and fiercest in the land. Roaring lions tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and my bones are out of joint. Do you get the picture? My bones are out of joint, my heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. Where was Christ's wound? Right, a spear, spear thrust through the side. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and feet. If you don't get goosebumps with that, you're just not reading they have pierced my hands and feet. I count all my bones. People share, stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. How did he know? How did David know? Only the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. Oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rem rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. 
I will declare your name to my brothers. Does that last verse sound familiar to you at all? You'll find it in Hebrews, uh, 20, uh, Hebrews 2, 12. And I want you to think about David saying, okay, Lord, uh, you save me. I will declare your name, which he does over and over again in the Psalms. But also Jesus did. And he tells us that, that when, when we remember him, he will remember us to his father. We don't, if we don't claim him, he's not going to claim us either. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. David is talking about himself here. He's saying, don't worry about me. God has not forgotten me. Even though I call out to his name, could not Jesus have said the same thing? To those who are gathered around the foot of the cross or to, those, uh, to, to the women there who were at the foot of the cross and who are wondering, where's God? Why doesn't God save him from this? And he's saying to them, you know what? He hadn't hidden his face from me. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who, will, who, who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those cannot keep themselves alive. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. For he has done this. And it just kind of makes my head swim when I stop and think about, about David in the middle of his circumstances, calling out to God. And even in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit reveals what's going to be happening in Jesus' work upon the cross. It's just amazing. And that's why this is the most often quoted of uh, Old Testament scripture in the New Testament. Turn to Psalm 21, if you will. Psalm 21 is pretty much a continuation of, of, Psalm, of Psalm 20. Uh, and if you will recall, last week when we read Psalm 20, I told you that it's done in the third person because David did pen it. He wrote it, but he wrote it as something that the people sang to him. So in Psalm 20, the people are singing uh, praise and prayer for David as he goes into battle. Psalm 21 is the people singing praise because David has returned from the battle victorious. So Psalm 20, he's going off to war. Psalm 21, he's coming back to war. So uh, these will be the people singing, although David did write this, uh, for the director of music, once again, a psalm of David. And this is written to be sung. O Lord, the king rejoices in your strength. How great is his joy in the victories you give. You have granted him the desire of his heart and have not withheld the request of of his lips. Selah. That means pause. So we shall do that. What, for what are they thanking God? They're thanking him for some kind of victory. It doesn't say here particularly how, but here's one key. If they said, look, the king, meaning, meaning David, has prayed to you. He has petitioned you for something, and you have granted him that petition. And so they're, 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 they're first thanking God for granting David's petition. In this particular case, it's a military victory. Uh, you've granted him the desire of his heart and have not withheld the request from his lips. So David has come and prayed. God has answered that prayer in the affirmative. You've welcomed him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. Let me stop right there. In the victory procession that would, uh, that would follow a military victory, uh, you, you might have even seen it in some of the, the, the epic movies of times gone by. But when the conquering heroes come in, uh, they're on the, the horses and chariots in the front, and the king will be wearing a crown. Uh, after them will follow a train of the captives and the people who they've, the, the booty that they've brought back, the, the plunder. So this is the picture that you get. You've welcomed him with blessings. Uh, that uh, David is coming back a conquering hero. He asked you for life, and you gave it to him. Length of days forever, ever. What do you think David prayed before he went into battle? Bring me back. 
extend my days. That's a, that is a very biblical, it's a very scriptural prayer. Lord, extend my days. And God did. It said you added, he asked you for life and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever through the victories you gave, his glory is great. You have bestowed on him splendor and majesty. Surely you have granted him eternal blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord through the unfailing love of the Most High. He will not be shaken. The people knew the source of David's victory. What was that? The Lord. David knew the source of the victory. And that's the person on whom he called before he went to battle. But it's kind of interesting that, that when they came back, uh, you remember the, the chant, you know, Saul is slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. But this chant was giving glory to God because David had schooled him, you understand. David had let the people know the, the battle is the Lord's. This is a conquering hero. This is a general. This is a great military victor. This is a king. And what's he saying compared to what he said when he was a stripling going out to battle against Goliath? The same thing. The same thing. And the people understood that. Surely you've granted him eternal blessings, for the king trusts in the Lord. Verse 8, your hand will lay hold of all your enemies. Your right hand will seize your foes. At the time of your appearing, you will make them like a fiery furnace. In his wrath, the Lord will swallow them up. And his fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, their posterity from mankind. Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. But you make them turn their backs when you aim at them with drawn bow. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your might. They are talking about a great military victory. And after they thanked the Lord for the victory, they pointed out the fate of those uh, over whom they were victorious. Your fire consumed them. Did it say David's soldiers consumed them? Who won the battle? The Lord. When I got here is when the Holy Spirit highlighted this for me. And, and I heard uh, a chorus that actually it was a song by Petra from many years back. But in heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against him will stand. And we sing glory. So I think about that song of praise, giving credit for the battle to the Almighty, to whom it belongs. And I don't know why that song popped into my head as I read this. And then I thought, you know what? This was written about a battle hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. Do we battle today? Yeah, we do. We do. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this is the point at which the world looks and says, well, here's a, another Baptist preacher, you know, talking crazy about spiritual warfare, and I don't want to hear about that. I just want to hear about me being happy. And I just want to hear about if I believe enough, God's going to give me a Cadillac. But here's something that struck me uh, is the fact that if I'm doing this right, if I'm placing my faith in Christ Jesus, then Satan's not going to be happy about that. If you don't believe Satan, that's all right. 
too bad for you. Jesus did. And he's going to attack, and the forces of evil are going to attack. Uh, they may be minor inconveniences. They may be major tragedies in your life. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And God has given us tools to win the battle. Here's the problem. We want to fight it in our own strength. Even Israel's kings other than David fought many battles in their own strength, and whenever they did, they were defeated. God promised them incredible victories. Think about Gideon. And remember I told you about Gideon's armies that God said, ah, 32,000 is way too many. How about 300? Because then when I grant you the victory, you'll know that it could only come through me. He could have raised up a champion. He, could Saul have defeated Goliath? Absolutely. Saul's daughter could have defeated Goliath with the power of God behind him. But when God wanted to make a point, he said, send out a shepherd boy with five rocks and a sling and defeat the greatest warrior known to man because the battle is mine. Knowing that, it's amazing to me that so often we choose the battle and we choose to fight it. I do. I do. I would suspect that you do too. But here's the interesting thing. God has promised us the victory. Remember, I read the back of the book, we win. We win. He's promised us the victory, not on our timetable, time not on our schedule, but he's promised us the victory. Why do we insist on fighting that battle? Had a discussion with a friend today about something I'd said about uh, uh, rebuking Satan. I'm real careful about that. Why would... And my question is always, why would you want to rebuke Satan? He says, I want to win the battle. Well, it's not just a win. What does God instruct us to do here? What are the, what are the weapons? What are the armor that we have? Truth, righteousness, ready that it comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. There's one offensive weapon there. What is that? The word. That's it. So when Jesus, faced with Satan's temptation, dealt with him with one weapon, the Word. He spoke to him in Scripture. That's our role. Let him fight the battle. Because we can't win it on our own. On our own. So as I was studying this, there was an awful lot going on in in my life and in the life of this church and in friends' lives and uh, in my family's lives, uh, and some very difficult things were happening. And I thought, you know, sometimes it seems like we're in a war. But then I thought, but you know what? We're going to win. The victory's guaranteed when we let whom fight it. The battle belongs to the Lord. And I think about David's words, and I'm, I'm blown away that a, a young boy would know this. But he said, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you, Satan, into our hands. Next week, it's kind of interesting because I've got a real short psalm coming up. But I could preach about 20 sermons on the real short psalm because there, if, if people don't know any other scripture, likely they know the 23rd psalm. So next week we're going to be in Psalm 23. It's the only one we're going to discuss next week, and I am quivering in anticipation. It is a great lesson that God has for us in the 23rd psalm and always has. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that the battle belongs to you. It is totally beyond our scope. It is totally uh, above our capabilities, Father, to fight the battle against the principalities of evil. But, Father, I thank you that you do care for us and that you do watch over us, that the battle is indeed yours, Father, and you have guaranteed a victory through your strength alone. I pray for this group, Father, who comes to study your word and pray that as they see these words penned so many hundreds of years ago, Father, that they will realize that they are applicable in our lives today just as much as they were then. 
And as we leave this place today, help us remember, Father, that we are people sharing Jesus. Or we do it in your name. Amen. Happy Mother.